So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the pre presentation, but I will be very short on this point because uh, I don't want to be considered as a bad scholar <laughs> being too long. <laughs> so I start uh, just now. Uh, I wanted, I will start saying that uh, my point of view is de deliberately normative. I thought of that as an excuse uh, because I was expecting to have to deal with uh, many uh, sociologists, uh, lawyers, and so on, but I am not the only one uh, who has a normative uh, approach. Uh, in my case, it means a philosophical approach uh, that uh, Sorry, oh, pay attention to the time. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, as we will see from my use of Kant. So, the normative nature of my remarks implies that it is not possible to infer directly from it practical consequences, pragmatic solution to the problems posed by contemporary immigration flows, I believe necessary to temporarily suspend such an objective in order to, the title, yeah, uh, so in, the, in order uh, to be able to assess the normative issues of contemporary migration. My reflection focuses on the modern concept of subjective rights and its relationship to modern democracy. In, one, in line with the thesis I defended in a book, uh, Democracy Without Demos, there is a, a Okay, there is now an English translation. I propose a deflationary interpretation of the sovereignty of the people, or popular sovereignty, and I make the principle of equal rights the main and distinctive element of modern democracy. First, a deflationary interpretation of people's sovereignty. This is an abstract principle of legitimization of political powers opposed to the sovereignty of the monarch. This principle, when formulated during the political revolution of the late 18th century, did not prejudge the modalities by which the governed could control the legislators and governments. The political regimes that emerged from these revolutions were not understood at the beginning as democracies. Secondly, equal freedom as a vehicle for the democratization of political regimes, it is in the name of equal rights that the dominated, in the words of Max Weber, the negative privileged, have claimed and conquered in Western societies over the past two centuries a generalization of political rights first, and then the establishment of new rights, social rights. It was only at the end of the 19th century that it became usual to call democracies the regimes that had developed from the political revolution of the 18, uh, late 18th century. This extension of rights took place within the framework inherited from earlier times of the territorial organization of the political power in the form of national states. The need for borders and the distinction between nationals, citizens, and foreigners result from this territorial structure of political power. The modern foreigner is a particular figure of the foreigner. As the French lawyer Daniel Lochac puts it, what ultimately characterizes the figure of the foreigner of the nation state is its politicization the foreigner is defined as, okay, no, the foreigner, not the national, the foreigner is defined as a non-national and inseparably as a non-citizen, one who does not belong in the political community constituted at uh, the state, uh, end of quotation. Since the democratization process took place within the framework of the nation state, a confusion has been established between democracy, people's people sovereignty, and state sovereignty. The consequence of this confusion is that the democratic people are held responsible for setting their own limits and therefore for justifying the exclusion of foreigners in the name of democracy. I shall have been Habib put a road there is a crucial link between democratic self-governance and territorial representation. Democratic laws require closure, 
precisely because democratic representation must be accountable to a specific people. An interpretation of democracy centered on the sovereignty of the people cannot solve this difficulty. It can argue for a generous reception policy, porous borders, as uh, Sheila Ben Habib does, uh, but it cannot help to understand why the negative status of the foreigner challenges the modern concept of right. The Austrian uh, historian Gerald Sturz once observed that foreigner is a status distinction of inferior rank, the only one that has resisted until now to the process of equalization of rights that was initiated in the late 18th century. But, that's my remark or my uh, answer, this resistance cannot be overcome since the status of foreigner is the projected, projected shadow of the status of national citizen. For this reason, I propose to leave temporarily aside the question of the conditions for the integration of foreigners into a democratic community already constituted, to focus instead on the denial of rights that result from, from the exclusion of foreigners. This exclusion undermines, this is my thesis, undermines the modern concept of right, which is just as essential to modern democracy as the abstract idea of people's sovereignty. The tension, contradiction, between the universal principle of equal rights and territorial sovereignty is reflected in the distinction usually made between human rights and citizen rights. The former being considered universal, the later reserved for nationals. Yet, the Declaration of Human Rights, French Declaration of Human Rights, Human Rights of 1789, uh, 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 proclaimed a universal right to citizenship, that is, to politics. I follow he, here the interpretation of Etienne Balibar in Equal Liberty, the Declaration of uh, 1789, integrally in it identified the rights of man with political rights, man, individual and collective, uh, with a member uh, political society, uh, identifies man, individual and collective with a member of political society. It goes to the idea of the right of man to politics, to politically institute all human activity in view of a liberation and equalization. End of quotation. The Universal Declaration of 1948 uh, uh, also does not allow to separate between human rights, uh, which would be fundamental and unconditional on the one side, and rights of citizenship, which would be, would be conditional on the other side, since this declaration subsumes the right of citizenship through the nationality under the human rights. The impossibility of separating human rights from citizens' rights is also evident on the practical level. Hannah Arendt has shown magnificently on the example of stateless persons in the interwar period that these persons were de facto deprived of any rights even when they were well fed and properly treated. I quote a passage from the, this famous text uh, that anticipate the central argument of the authors who today criticize the humanitarian reason. Neither, just the beginning, uh, neither physific, physical safety being fed by some state or private welfare agency, nor freedom of opinion change in the least their fundamental situation of rightlessness. The prolongation of their lives is due to the charity and not to the right for no law exists which could force the nation to feed them, so and so on. So it could be argued that the situation has changed since the time of Arendt. There are now international conventions that guarantee migrants some minimal fundamental rights. But for illegal migrants to be able to claim these rights, they must know them and have access to lawyers. However, police management and administrative practices often prevent them from doing so. Border control, the denial of migrants' access to Mediterranean harbor, 
but also the disconnection between spatial and legal borders that the uh, Okay, sorry. That the topic of uh, Ayala Shasha, the shifting border of uh, immigration regulation, uh, are precisely intended to prevent migrants from gaining a foothold in a place where they could claim rights. Moreover, even when they have done it, their closure in camps deprives them of presumed fundamental human rights to mobility, to family life, etc. Daniel Loshak again who is a specialist for uh, human rights, notes in the case of France, when police laws become increasingly coercive, they hinder such basic, basic rights as the freedom to come and go, the right to family life, the right to health, etc. The affirmation of full equal rights become completely meaningless. Uh, on the level of constitutional law, this contradiction is resolved by fiction, the neo-Westphalian fiction, Every human being is supposed to be a citizen of a given country, a democratic country, by birth or naturalization. This makes it possible to conceive democratic citizenship via the nationality as a universal right, while preserving the right of each state to determine its own reception policy. This is, of course, a fiction, since everyone knows that the nation states in the world are far from being all democratic. So I have a quotation of the universal human rights, uh, important is the idea of a common standard for all people and who shall strive. Okay, it's not just now that the, the conditions are effective. I am the, therefore starting not from the pragmatic question of the conditions for the inclusion of migrants in the countries where they apply for reception, as I, I have already said, but from their exclusion in its extreme forms. The condition of migrants confined in camps, the death of migrants in the Mediterranean. These extreme cases reveal the truth about the status of the foreigner in our societies. Internment and expulsion measures, even if they concern only a small uh, 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 proportion of foreigners, illegal migrants, residing in a country, cannot be considered as a marginal aspect of the foreigner's legal and political status. They are the paroxysmal manifestation of the precariousness of his rights. The foreigner even when he has managed to cross the border of the country he is trying to reach, is and remains reliable to expulsion. The important point for my purpose is therefore not the quantitative dimension of this exclusion, but its nature, from what are foreigners excluded. What I want to, sh to show is that this exclusion undermines the modern democratic understanding of rights in general, and therefore also affects the rights of citizens themselves. This is where I bring Kant in. Uh, I just point out that my use of Kant is not based on the texts that are usually used to deal with the, uh, no, essentially based on the texts that are usually uh, used to deal with the right to hospitality, because the problems that Kant addresses under the same international trade, colonial abuses, are very different from those posed by contemporary mass migrations. I take Kant here the most systematic interpreter of the specifically modern notion of subjective rights, and for this reason also the most profound interpreter of the mutation of the concept of right induced by the Declaration of Rights of the late 18th century. In the third part of the conflict of faculties, Kant explain that... Uh, Okay, Kant explained the enthusiasm aroused by the French Revolution among his observers, observers by the strictly moral element of this revolution, namely the pure concept of right. A passage from the introduction to his science of right allows to understand what he means by the pure concept of right. In this passage, uh, Kant distinguishes between innate and acquired rights acquired rights are those 
which are able and required to be granted by the law of the civil state, that is, the state, while innate rights cannot be granted that way. The, these innate rights, innate rights are freedom and equality, freedom, that is, independence of the compuls compulsory will for, of others, equality, that is, the right of each man to be independent of being bound by others to anything more than to which he may also reciprocally bind them, or to be his own master by right sui juris. Liberty and equality are therefore two sides of the same coin, which leads Kant to conclude that das angeborene Recht ist nur ein einziges, also there is only one innate right. It is the idea of innate right that dictates Kant's understanding of citizenship. He determines citizenship by three principles or attributes that inseparably belong to the citizen by right. Constitutional freedom, equality, independence. The mention of independence is a concession of Kant to the social conditions existing in Germany at his time. Women and domestic servants did not enjoy legal personality. They were not legally independent. This leads Kant to distinguish between active citizens enjoying political rights and passive citizens, ordinary members, protected by law. But this distinction poses a problem to Kant himself, uh, as he notes in the science of right, it seems to stand in contradiction to the definition of a citizen as such. It is not just an appearance, it, it is indeed a contradiction, since the first of the attributes that are constitutive of citizenship, constitutional freedom, is, after Kant, the right of every citizen to have to obey no other law than to that to which he was given his consent or approval. So, passive citizens, because they are not independent, are not free or equal in the sense that Kant gives to these terms. There are, as he says in another text, only members of the civil society protected by the law Schutzgenossen. However, Kant's legal and political theory is based on the idea that rights, insofar as they are derived from man's innate right to equal freedom, cannot be understood as mere protections. It is the idea that drives his criticism of paternalistic powers and all sorts of tutelage. For example, in the essay, What is Enlightenment? I cannot go any further into the commentary on Kant's text, what I wanted to emphasize is the fundamental logic of his interpretation of rights. From this point of view, his hesitations, contradictions, and concessions to the social condition of his time are secondary. The pure concept of right, in which he saw the decisive innovation of the French Revolution, is a conception of right based on the idea of the innate freedom of all human beings, which implies self-determination. Self rights which are only granted by a power, be it, be it authoritarian or benevolent, are no rights in the strict modern sense of the term. So we have here a good starting point for understanding the fundamental reason why human rights and citizens' rights are inseparable. Kant's innate right is the equivalent of Arendt's right to have a right. It is a right that precedes any legal right and any law, but from which all legal determined rights and duties in democratic societies derive their force of obligation, as Kant writes it in the Lalas, in the passage of the Lalas, the force that binds in any right, die verbindende Kraft alles Rechts. As the precariousness on the rights granted to foreigners by domestic legislation or international conventions is due to the fact that, there are that, sorry, that these purported rights are constructed and conceived as mere protections. But we have to add one more element to answer the question I asked earlier from what are illegal migrants excluded? The first answer will be they are excluded from the possibility of accessing a specific country where they request to be admitted. But camps, 
whatever they are, official refugee camps, waiting areas for people in transit, detention and administrative detention centers, etc., or informal migrant camps in our cities, jungles in France, etc., reflect a much wider exclusion. The difficulties or impossibility of repatriating them come from the fact that the encamped individuals, it is a reference to the work of uh, Michel Agi, a French uh, anthropologue, uh, the encamped individuals actually do not have a place on earth to live free. I insist on both words, live and free. They have no place to live free, that is, that even if their nationality is established, the country from which they have fled is subject to an authoritarian, corrupt, or failed regime, so that they do not enjoy in that country the freedoms that are essential for democratic citizenship. But also no place to live, in the simplest sense, that is to say that generally, whatever the formal state of freedoms may be in their country of origin, the economic conditions poverty, massive unemployment, wars, and so on, that prevail there, do not ensure them the most basic means of existence. The distinction made by the governments of our country, France in particular, between political refugees and economic refugees is artificial. Formal freedoms are meaningless when socioeconomic conditions make survival a daily problem and prevent any life project. Here again, I will rely on Kant to explain the link between this dimension of exclusion and the modern concept of right. Kant's interpretation of rights is not as formal as it, his interpreters generally admit. Indeed, at different moments in his science of right, to justify the right of private property, but also of cosmopolitan right, that I that, uh, that is the right to hospitality, he uses a curious argument, the sphericity of the Earth's surface. This argument is curious and arouses the perplexity of many commentators because it seems that Kant is committing a naturalistic fallacy. That is the reproach of uh, Sheila Benabi in the last quotation here. So that uh, the reference to a fact in an approach that pretends to be purely normative. I leave aside the solution uh, proposed by Sheila Benhabib to resolve this difficulty, namely the distinction in the, uh, the line of uh, alls uh, between the justificatory premises and circumstances of justice. This distinction obscures, in this case, a remarkable characteristic of Kant's conception of law. Unlike Aristotle, unlike Hegel, Kant does not base the normativity of legal politic organization on an ethical disposition to sociability, be it named solidarity or fraternity. The law regulates only the exterior relationship between human beings, that is, the relations that they are compelled to have with each other because they cannot live separately. So the only problem that the legal political organization must solve is that of peaceful coexistence between free beings forced by the limitation of the world space to have mutual relations. The core of Kant's conception of rational right can finally be summarized in one sentence. The legal political organization of the world must be such that it guarantees the conditions of freedom for all. The Kant normative justification of law and politics is fundamentally individualistic, and one can question its limit, particularly with regard to his justification of private property. Kant, Kant doesn't give us any means to determine a distributive justice in the modern sense, but it should be underlined that private property is by Kant a specific mode of access to the common, it means the earth, that is the material means essential to a free life, and that this access must be allowed to everyone without exception. This implies that the modern conception of right is incompatible with exclusion, and even more, that a political structuration of the world that prevents some human beings from finding a place on earth to live freely compromises the normative foundation of modern rights in general. 
The meaning or implication of the modern revolutionary concept of rights, okay, is uh, uh, therefore required that we consider the partition of the world between all human beings. This partition must be such that every human being finds a place to live freely. This is the problem facing us in contemporary migration. For not only the surface of the planet finished, as long Kant, as Kant pointed out, but this surface, at least its habitable places, is entirely occupied. There are no longer any places on Earth where human beings whom political repression, war or misery drive out of their countries could settle with some chance of rebuilding their lives. Conclusion. Two points. I summarize and conclude two points. First of all, it is essential to distinguish between rights and protections. The confusion between the two is fueled by what the sociologist, sociologist Didier Fassin calls the no, not, not, humanitarian reason. The assistance that public bodies and NGOs provide to migrants is certainly useful and necessary, but it is based on the logic of charity it tends to deny the migrants as a subject of right in the sense of Kant. The fact that migrants do not have citizenship rights, broadly understood as right to politics, makes it possible to restrict their human rights indefinitely, unless one considers that fundamental human rights mean nothing more than the right not to be tortured, to live a vegetative life that is to be fed and housed. Besides, this confusion between rights and protections contaminates the rights of citizens themselves. It is symptomatic that social rights are generally referred to by political, political rulers as social protections, which, de which depend on the goodwill of these political rulers and can therefore be curtailed ad libitum, in particular by invoking budgetary constraints. Also symptomatic is the tendency of our governance to shift the issue of social justice to poverty management, that is, assistance. At the German, uh, okay, I have a quotation of uh, a translation from German to English, for me, so I'm not sure it's very clear. Only if one presupposes, uh, he noted that uh, about the poverty, yeah? only if one presupposes uh, only if a right of the poor is presupposed that the legal social fiction is the aid to the poor removed from the arbitrariness and no longer dependent on the contingent state of finances and other uncertain factors. Uh, political freedoms themselves are not immune to these restrictions as shown by the legislative amendments that cut them off under the pretext of security for example, in France, the recent introduction into ordinary law of measures that fall within the scope of the state of emergency. Secondly, second, uh, the right to hospitality, the right to hospitality, that is the right of each human being to have a place on the earth to live free, is indisputable. For this right is the source for of every right understood as the manifestation of a freedom that can only be conceived as universal. The migrants who rush to our borders can claim the fundamental right that results from, I quote, count the common position of the earth where as the globe they cannot infinitely disperse and hence must finally uh, toler tolerate each other since Originally, no one has more right than another to a particular part of the earth. The question of the duty of hospitality is more complex. Here again, the parallel is striking with the problem of poverty, about which Zimmel, Georg Zimmel noted that it is absolutely not obvious to determine to whom the right claim of the poor is addressed. To whom? to which power instance the migrants' claim is addressed. Here again, we are confronted with the sovereignty of states. The individual who claims a place to live freely on Earth implicitly addresses the rule of humanity, but it is always at the door of a particular state that he comes to knock. The paradox of the innate right is that it can be recognized is indeed recognized today by legal texts of international scope, 
but its implementation necessarily depends in every case on a particular political power with a state or another kind of political power. However, there, there is no normative reason to attribute to any of these powers, that is to a particular states, the responsibility for ensuring this implementation. The only way, and I come to the end of mine, the only way to solve this aporia is to broaden our understanding of the institutions responsible for the implementation and denial of the rights in general by examining the cause, causes of mass migration that contemporary democratic states are confronted with. These causes are diverse. As far as Europe and the United States are concerned, the immigration that poses a problem for them, the greatest problem for them, is that of poor, even miserable populations. The massive migratory flows that today are endangering the foundation of modern democracy by inducing a false comprehension of what right means, are, to a large extent, one of the manifestations of the extreme poverty that exists in different places on our planet, a poverty that results from the global organization of powers, both economic and political. These powers are now so closely intertwined that it is artificial to distinguish between political refugees and economic refugees. Dictatorial regimes benefit from the tolerance, sometimes from the benevolence, of the political leaders of democratic states and international institutions as long as the regimes ensure that their markets are open to the products of companies from industrialist countries, that they provide multinational companies with cheap labor that can be exploited locally, that they allow the predation of their natural resources by foreigners, and that they maintain control over their populations through all possible means. Only those states that cease to be interesting and reliable partners to the economic interests of the countries of the first world are declared failed. It is hypocritical to attribute the flight of hypocritical the flight of population only to the corruption of governments of their country of origin, forgetting that this corruption is perpetuated and sometimes generated by the practices of large multinationals. It's, it is also hypocritical to deplore the inability of the states concerned to ensure the economic development of their countries when the natural resources that could allow this development are monopolized for the benefit of rich countries without any benefit being gained by the local populations. All these phenomena are amply described today, and this is not the place here to illustrate, uh, analyze them in more detail. The point I am trying to make here is this. Since a modern democracy is based on the right of every human being to live in freedom, its dynamics must be in accordance with the dynamics of the powers that impede the realization of this right. The main reason why the shame of uh, the scheme of self-determination self has definitely lost all relevance to reflect self-legislation, to reflect uh, uh, modern democracy, is that many of the powers to which contemporary forms of exclusion are owned are beyond any possibility of popular control, while the power scope for action for which such control still aims retains some reality is increasingly limited. These conditions obviously complicate the assignment of a subject to the, youth, to the duty of hospitality. Global poverty is a product of a reticular organization of powers, an organization without a head and therefore without a responsible person to turn uh, to. Turn to. In line with the analysis of Thomas Pogge, I would argue that the diffusion of responsibilities is not the absence of responsibility. The globalized world is a man-made world shaped by a set of institutions, economic, legal, and political, public and private, to whose existence, to whose existence all citizens of the world contribute through their action or inaction. All, therefore, share responsibility for the state of this world to very different degrees, of course. This responsibility is greater for the citizens of rich countries 
who benefit from this situation, and a fortiori for the most privileged among them. And it, it is even greater for individuals who have a say in decisions that involve collective destinies. This responsibility is political, if by politics we mean the organization of common life, the sharing of the earth. And the obligations associated with it, with this responsibility, are not merely moral, because they do not stem from the sympathy that every human being is supposed or obliged to feel towards another human being. Could I ask you to uh, final uh, uh, the last sentence. But from our co-responsibility in the denial of rights that produce poverty and mass migration. The right to hospitality is an enforceable right, is not an enforceable right in the sense of positive law, but there is a corresponding duty which is not first and foremost a duty to welcome people into our homes, but a duty to act by all available means to transform the world that produces poverty and mass migrations. And as long as this transformation is still pending, the duty of hospitality is imperative for states that I consider democratic, however difficult it may be to organize it in practice. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.